Hello, everybody, and welcome back to The Advisor with Stacey Chalemi. And I'm very excited today because we have a very special guest. She is a lawyer, and her name is Hillary Walsh. She is an amazing individual who owns a law firm that was very successful over the course of years through hard work and diligence. And today, she wants to talk about feedback, the different types of feedback there is, and what feedbacks really are beneficial and what feedbacks are not and also how to go about how, uh, giving feedback and also receiving it too. And so today I have Hillary and she's gonna tell us a lot about feedback and, and help us in our own lives and also in our businesses as well. So it's a pleasure to have you, Hillary. I'm very excited to have this conversation. You know, feedback, you know, isn't talked about a lot, but it's a very important topic that could help a business grow. And even in a relationship, it could help a relationship grow. And if you don't get the right feedback, if it's not said the right word, way, it could have a very negative effect. And sometimes it's hard when people, you know, get a negative taste in their mouth. It's, it's easy it's for some to let go, but for others, not so easy. So, you know, I'd like to hear more about what you have to say about feedback. But before we begin, I really would love to hear a little about you, yourself, and your background. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Stacey. It's awesome to be here with you. Um, my background is in immigration law. I have for the past 12 years done only immigration law. I love being able to help families either immigrate to the United States or if they're already here and maybe they're undocumented, being able to help them get their papers. My husband was in the Air Force for over 20 years and I I really view this as my my version of patriotism where people are already here. I don't, I don't want people to be separated from their little kids. Um, and that's oftentimes what happens when families, you know, moms or dads get deported. So let's see what the law has available for folks and be able to help with them with that. Now, I'm originally from Kansas and met my husband, who's from Jersey, um, and that was through the military lifestyle. And we lived in Japan and Korea and Vegas and Texas. Um, we lived in England, and then we got stationed here in Phoenix about six years ago now, and this is where we have made our home. So we love it in the desert, um, as hot as it may be sometimes, but um when I first moved back to Arizona after after being a military spouse overseas for about five years, I was trying really hard to find a job. I wanted to go work at an immigration law firm, but because I don't speak Spanish and I'm in a border state, most of the clientele in Arizona um, are Spanish speakers. And so I was helpful to folks from a perspective of knowing immigration law, but pretty useless to them when it came time for me to actually communicate with clients. And so I couldn't get a job and decided, well, I guess I'll just start my own company. And I thought I would just, just be me and work out of my kitchen kind of a thing. And now I have about 130 employees and we have the, one of the fastest growing law firms in the U S so I feel very fortunate to have that. But along the way I have made so many mistakes and a lot of them have been around the idea of accountability and feedback because uh, entrepreneurs like to give the critical feedback, or I guess we we may not like to give it, but we we will give it yeah. because we uh, we want to get the job done. And if all the pain and suffering and the idea of calling up your employee or even talking to your spouse, and giving them the truth about how this thing is bothering me, like I'll go through it, I'll get it done because I, I care about the goal and and the target that much. But mm -hmm. through marriage counseling, I realized I was handed a book um, called Boundaries Made Easy. And inside it was the, the nuggets about how feedback actually, not only should we seek to receive it, but there's more than more to feedback than just critical feedback. So jokingly, I said, well, I'm going to make feedback my new favorite F word. And so I'd love to visit with you about that today. I love it. You know, I, I think it's so important because sometimes it's so easy to look at the flaws of others, but it's very hard to look at our own flaws. And a lot of times when we tend to point out things to other people, it, it could really, you know, people don't like to hear, you know, their, their weaknesses or, you know, what they're doing wrong. And, but then you could also take something, it could be, 
it could, you know, it could be a sentence or two and you could say it three different ways. And one, you know, one way could have a negative impact on the, on the individual. And if you just change it a little bit, or maybe change the tone in your voice, it seems like it could be a total turnaround where someone could take it and say, oh, okay. You know, and then if you maybe say something, you know, positive at the end, you know, or in the beginning, like, I know you've been trying really hard, but I see a little, a couple little areas that, you know, might, we might be able to tweak to make it, you know, this more effective, you know, just different ways of saying things I think, you know, could be so, so beneficial. But I, I think a lot of people sometimes don't even think sometimes before they speak and they just want to get their point across and, you know, I think it's really important that we, you know, you mentioned that there's three different types of feedback that we go over the different types of feedback and maybe suggestions that you might have on the, the best ways or the most constructive ways that have the most positive impact on individuals when we do try to give that feedback to other people. For sure. And I want to give credit where it's due because I am not the researcher who came up with these three types of feedback. This is all from a book called Thanks for the Feedback, which mm -hmm. encourages exactly what you're talking about, learning to appreciate receiving feedback rather than feeling kind of crappy at the end of it or hurt or wounded or like you've been made to feel this big. Um, and that's really the emphasis of that book. But the three types are critical feedback, which you and I know what that is. Everybody who's listening knows what that is. We've been on the receiving end. We've probably been on the giving end. We, we know what critical feedback is. The next is coaching or mentoring feedback. I, I really like to think of it as what would a teacher say in this moment yeah. rather than what would a manager or a boss say. And right. because I'm such a direct, no filter person, yeah. I really have to reprogram myself to stop giving critical feedback. And in my mind say, what would a coach, what would a teacher, what would a mentor say right now? Because it's going to soften the edges and actually make it where it's receivable to the person. Because if you go in with my, my normal style, which I have messed up so many relationships by being way too direct. And usually it's because I've bottled up frustration mm -hmm. and I've not said anything and I've not said anything. So then when I finally get the balls to do it, next thing you yeah. know, I'm being way too critical. They're not understanding why, where is this all coming from? And, it, and it, it's not very effective. Yeah. And then the third type of feedback is appreciation feedback. And right. that has become a big part of who I am. I've just, I did not realize that that was that gratitude and saying thank you and identifying how much you appreciate the effort or the work or the behind the scenes that people are doing, including my spouse. Like I don't feel appreciated sometimes from my spouse. He doesn't feel appreciated sometimes. And yet we will be for sure to criticize something that the other person hasn't done right. And that's just no way to live. So those are the three main types. Um, and then we can kind of dive in and explore from here. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think it's, I love the idea of, of giving appreciation and gratitude, because I think that we lack that in our society. You know, we tend to, you know, forget that, you know, it means so much if you could just, you know, because I think sometimes, you know, I learned this through my own experiences in life, you know, you don't realize how valuable someone or something in your life is until it's taken away. And then that's when you realize if and it happens to many people. And the, the worst part of that is that a lot of times when we realize how valuable that person was, it's too late because they're no longer here in our lives. And, and you don't want to wait till that point, you know, you know, sometimes I feel like sometimes it's good just to have a, um, a morning of gratitude or even a gratitude jar and, and think about the things in your life or the people in your life around you that you have gratitude for and appreciation for. And if you create that mindset, especially in the morning, sometimes we stay aware, aware of these things and it can put us on a good frame of mind. I don't know what your impact or your thoughts are on that. Yeah. I, I, for our team in particular, I have been accused of being cheesy, but I'm totally okay, okay. with it. But in, I'll start, um, I have meetings with certain folks every month and I always have a leadership meeting every month where all, all of our leadership get together and we will start with playing. I play two songs 
is where it gets cheesy and people just have to follow along. And then, you know, they're your, they're your people. Cause if they don't want to do it, then you're like, I don't know if you're going to last here, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but uh, you got to have the attitude of gratitude. And sometimes it's a bit cheesy, but I put on two songs. I just love one is um, it's by Lizzo called special. And I just love that song. And then the other is by Katy Perry and it's called only love. And oh. it's from one of her albums. I feel like she released it in 2020 and it, it just, she wasn't able to market it. It's, I think a really slept on album. In any event, <laughs> I put those two songs on back to back and we all mute and we open up a um, appreciation channel that we have in our, um, in our firm teams, like our teams channels. Mm -hmm. And for two, the, for those two songs, we just write messages to people who do not interact with us on a day to day. Cause if you and I work together, I'm going to tell you, thank you. I'm going to, yeah. because we work together every day. We bump into each other a lot. Um, I'm going to tell you, thank you. You're going to see if I'm in a crappy mood and know like, Hey, you know, maybe, maybe Hillary needs a cup of coffee or whatever it might be. Yeah. We're going to have that relationship. But when you don't work with people directly, where they see all the different seasons of your day, your month, your year, they're not going to be told thank you enough. And then if they screw up and they get put on a performance improvement plan, have we really, have we really given them a whole, like a full diet of feedback? I don't think so because right. all of us respond so well to oh, wow, I'm doing this thing right. I want to do more of this thing because this yeah. thing worked for that person. Yeah. But if we're only told what we're doing wrong, it's like it's like getting zapped with a, an electric shock just when yeah. we do things wrong. It actually makes yeah. you scared to do anything. And so right. we do this once a month and I do it with different team members. Like, so I'll have my leadership meeting or I'll have just my department leads um, and they're going to send um, messages out and it's company wide. Yeah. Everybody starts seeing it blow up. And what's so cool is some team members won't know that we're in the meeting. They'll just yeah. think, oh, we're having an appreciation moment and they start joining in and you'll get 40 or 50 responses for folks. And it does like what you're describing. It sets the tone for the day. It puts into perspective how little yeah. critical feedback is necessary and how much appreciation feedback is necessary because it reframes our experience of ourselves and others. Yes. Oh, definitely. I think it, it's so important that, you know, that we, that especially when you don't hear from a person on a day-to-day -day basis, I like that. Cause when you, when you play the music, it really, I think music is so therapeutic because sometimes it just, it, it takes us to a different level and it kind of like um, it takes down that barrier and it brings you to a level of calmness where you have clarity and you can really think about, you know, what's valuable in your life, the people that are valuable in your life, the people who work with you, like you might, like you said, you don't see on a day-to-day -day basis, but you know, they do a lot for you. They might be in a, in a different department or a different sector of the community, you know, in the company and you just, they, they're always there. They're always doing what you ask, but, you know, to send a little note, to send a little appreciation and to say, you know, thank you for always, you know, having my back or for always helping me when I, when I need that help or getting to getting these things to me on time. You know, I think it makes someone feel good. Like they're being, you know, that they're appreciated. They're being recognized that, you know, that they're, work is valued and that they feel special. I think sometimes, you know, it's important for people just, you know, when you give constructive feedback and you give, but you say it in a positive way, or you give appreciation and gratitude, it makes a person feel like they're valued. And a lot of times people don't get that even at home, you know, so if, if a work member says it and, and it's, it's, you know, it's what they do because that your work sometimes becomes, you know, it's, it's, it just, it, it, you're, you're doing it all the time. So when people see your talents and they recognize it and they appreciate it, it could really, you know, make that person's self-esteem, you know, boost up and, and really get their morale up where they want to keep doing more and more. So I think that's a great idea of how you yeah, have the lead. It's, it's been so fun and people will cry when they're giving the feedback, like oh. how amazing is it for you to, to tap into? And this is a great exercise to do even, um, even with non-team members, just folks who in your life you haven't given enough gratitude to. One of my friends, and he's hosted several gratitude um, kind of like sessions, I guess is what you would call it, um, yeah. is a guy named Chris Shembra. And he's he calls himself the gratitude guy. And 
he helps companies really inject gratitude as part of your overall culture. And uh, we host, he hosted a couple of meetings for us and people just, we forget how, it, you know, we create our own energy. I really believe that. So like, if, if you're tired, you have to, you have to do some push ups or you gotta, you know, you gotta create some positive energy because energy creates more energy. And if you want to create a culture of, gratitude, collaboration, creativity. If you, if you're, maybe your culture is kind of fear-based and we've had that a little bit in my company. I, I wish, yeah. uh, I wish that weren't true, but it is where people feel afraid of making mistakes. That's usually because we have gotten out of balance with the amount and type of feedback we're giving. I yeah. actually don't believe in feedback sandwiches. People talk about how when you give negative feedback, that should be like the peanut butter and jelly, but the bread on either end, of the peanut butter and jelly should be positive feedback. Mm -hmm. I don't really believe in lacing feedback with other extra things. I think this is a moment where I would like to give you some feedback. Are you open to that? Yes, I am. Um, so you kind of get their consent and say, well, this is actually some critical feedback here, this couple of things, or this is some, this is some teaching feedback, coaching feedback, because you have to, in your mind, think, what do I want this person to feel at the end of this? I don't want yeah. them to feel afraid, but in any event, um, sometimes it's just great to be able to give them appreciation feedback, which can be done in public where coaching or teaching or, um, critical feedback should be done in private. Um, if you have a culture like mine used to be where it had too much fear and not enough gratitude, that's because we weren't giving enough appreciation feedback. And it's an easy, it's not a fast, you can't flip a U on the highway and go the other direction, but yeah. you can chart a new course and it, it can be a healthy environment where we know that we're adults. We know we're here to be accountable. We know we need to hit these targets, but I feel that my work is also appreciated as I go along the journey. And yeah. that's just been a game changer for us. I think it's huge. I think when you're able to be able to show appreciation and the person knows, well, there I'm I'm appreciated. So that's right there then is is a positive, you know, you're having a positive impact on the person. And when you just give constructive criticism, but you're you're showing how much you appreciate them, you're and so they get the feeling that I am worth something. You know, they're just trying to help me rather than just like you know going straight for the gundo and and you know being you know brief, blunt, and to the point. Where I think as we get older too, we we tend to get more and more you know. I, I've noticed that I've gotten more blunt, you know, as I've gotten older, where I wasn't so much like that in my younger days. But it, I think as you get older, and you get more experienced, you're more straightforward. And, you know, and as like you said, entrepreneurs, you know, you want to get the job done, you want to get a job done quickly, you want the results there. But when you're working with a team, you have to make the team feel like they're they're worth you know something, and I I think that's so important. Now, do you do you know for for people who are out there that have you know businesses and and they have um you know different types of things going on in, in their industry, you know what would be some suggestions that you found very beneficial when it comes to giving feedback that you've seen a huge you know impact in your own law firm. Yeah, if people can follow me on I'm on Instagram, it's attorney Hillary. Hillary spelled with two L's, like Hillary. I think it's like Hillary Duff. I'm gonna say that, but I know it's like Hillary Clinton. So for our age, we know how Hillary Clinton spells her Hillary. Um, and I have like uh different things you can download that help with sales and help with this type of, you know, almost coaching your team and really thinking about being a teacher. But asking our team and and challenging yourself to really rethink what feedback and delegation, what the purpose and what the point is, because feedback and delegation are tied to each other. And yes. both of those things are inside jobs. Because when we start to really view ourselves, and I have, I, I think it was two weeks ago, I, I with my team, I did this. Um, I asked them to write out in a narrative form and then push enter. And it's all like a chat in um, in Teams who was the most impactful teacher in your life and what was it that they taught you and how was it that they made you feel? Right. And so we started, you know, everyone's sitting and people get emotional when you think about, I mean, it is an exhilarating and, and 
almost um, bittersweet experience because like you described, not everybody's with you forever. And so sometimes it's too late. You realize how impactful a teacher was too late because now they're gone. Yeah. And I'm not talking about like a school teacher. Sometimes your teacher was a former boss. Maybe they were a classmate. Maybe they were a mentor, whatever yeah. it was, it might be too late, but we can um, kind of help their legacy that they have planted inside you help mm -hmm. it live on. Because when we think about, I want to delegate a task to someone, but it's faster for me to get it done myself and it's right. going to be done right. And what that ends up being is I have decided not to be that teacher to this person. Right. I've decided I'm not going to help grow another person because it just takes me too freaking long. And then you, when you say it like that, you're like, oh, that's true. So all of us have to, as entrepreneurs, as leaders, as managers, as anyone who's in an employee cycle of maturation, where now we're training other team members, we have to think of ourselves as teachers first, and then really think about what is the type of teacher I want to be? And how do I want to leave my student? Because yeah, they're not going to do it right. And it is absolutely going to take them longer to do it. And they're absolutely not going to do it as good as you're going to do it. But if I'm dedicating my life to teaching, imagine how that reframe helps. And so I think that alone is just a really great, okay, I, I remember now I, I want to, I have an aspiration that's outside of myself. I have an aspiration of, I really want to be this teacher who saw things in me, who put that I didn't see in myself, who pushed yeah. me way before I was ready. Um, right. That was so helpful for me because I would still be like, uh, busing, I would still be a waitress. If right. I hadn't really been pushed by some of my great teachers in my life, um, who saw more in me than, and I was a really good waitress. I'm not going to lie, <laughs> but they saw more. They're like, you should be going, you should go to college. You know, you should go to college. Yeah. You should try this other stuff and like forge your own way. So yeah. now it's my responsibility because that's the teacher I want to be, whether the student is ready for me or not, that's on them. But that's yes. the kind of teacher I want to be when it comes to feedback and when it comes to delegation, which are totally tied to each other. And that's a great point that you made because I've heard so many people who are bosses or owners of businesses say, you know, I, I have to do it all myself because it's not going to get done the right way. It's not going to get done the way it's supposed to get done or in time. And, and you know, and, you know, they, then they feel stressed and then they, you know, over time that burnout sets in and, and they're not doing as good of job because they never took the time out to be a teacher. Because, you know, I, and, and I liked how you put that because a lot of times they just, they just say, well, I, I, you know, it can't be done as good as I am, you know, the way I do it. And, and that's it. And the conversation is, you know, that's the answer, you know, but if they, you know, if you reverse it, like you did, and the real meaning is, is that you just don't want to take the time out to teach the other person. Because, you know, I, that's the, one of the biggest, I think, things that is done that makes a company kind of go downhill is that the owner of the company or, you know, or business is trying to do it all because they don't think everybody else can do it as good of, you know, as good. And instead of delegating and teaching and then delegating and then trying to step back and do other things that could be more constructive they're focusing on trying to do it all, which is virtually impossible and, and ends up in, in, you know, in a negative way. Yeah. It ends up, you're basically, John Maxwell talks about like in his 21 irrefutable laws. I really only got through like the first one because it's a long book, but he yeah. talks about the law of the lid. And if you put a lid on any aspect of your personal or professional development and say, that's, that's the cap, that's the top for me then yeah. you're not going to go higher. So you're either going to burn out because you're trying to push through it physically rather than just like literally lifting off the lid yeah. um, or, or you're just stuck financially and then your business won't be able to grow right. and you won't be able to help as many people. And the whole reason yeah. our businesses exist is to help change others' lives. I don't care if you're selling lipstick or sneakers or for me, immigration services, yeah. each of these products, people buy it because they want to have something different in their life. And if you're really doing life-changing work, then again, it's it's an inside job of like, do I really want to make an impact? Do I really want to do this? Not only for my client who's paying me, but for my employee who is dedicating a vast majority of their waking hours to furthering my mission. Holy crap. Mm -hmm. That is like really, really kind of them to do. 
Mm -hmm. So it's wow. like feedback is the accountability part of delegation. And then they, you have a cycle where it's, then you delegate again and you practice getting better at delegating. Yeah. And it's like this time, you know, you're going to, in education, they call it like the gradual release of responsibility where we do with, I shadow you, and then I watch you do it. And then you do it on your own. And that's the delegation. And it's so hard. It's I, I preach this stuff, but it's really hard to actually put it in practice. Like yeah. you have aspiration and then you have reality. And so yeah. you, let's just be somewhere in between <laughs> um, <laughs> is, is kind of the goal. But I think that when we really, when we think about not only I, am I going to, I'm going to forfeit the time that it takes to teach, mm -hmm. but I'm going to invest in this other person. And even if they leave my company and they go work somewhere else, I have planted something in them. That's going to help them as a human. That's yeah. it. That's life-changing work. And so yeah. like, it's okay if they leave, that's actually pretty normal. I'm not married to them, but right. I can make them really good. And then anybody else who interacts with them along the way, I hope that I blessed them too. You know, that's a great way of looking at it, you know, sometimes, you know, cause there are times where you've had someone for a while and now they're ready to take the next step and move on. And instead of looking at it in a negative way, look at it as, you know, like you said, you've planted a seed in that person and now they can take what you've taught them and grow in a different area. Because it, I so believe that sometimes we just, we journey along and, you know, people are meant to, you know, not stay always in our lives forever, but they, they stay for a portion. They teach you some certain things, maybe that you didn't know. You teach them some certain things and qualities and, you know, people just move through life. It's, it's a cycle. And uh, I, I think that's a great way of, of looking at things too, you know, instead of, and I love the idea that you talked about, you know, not, you know, taking that you can't, you know, have a lid on, you know, so many times people, you know, put that lid, that invisible lid, and they don't even realize that they're doing it. And they end up, you know, hurting themselves at the end because they, it stops their growth. And, you know, it's really important not to have that lid on, like you, you mentioned. My marriage counselor oftentimes will ask me, do you want to be right? Or do you want to be effective? Yeah, I like that. And it's like, oh, because I want I want both. Can I have both? Yeah. <laughs> I think we all want both. <laughs> Rarely can you have both. And so much of in so much of marriage counseling for me is individual counseling, which then helps me be a better spouse, helps me be a better mom, helps me be a better boss, helps me be a better lawyer, because it's all the inside work that has to happen in all these areas so that the lid can be raised a little higher. The ceiling can be raised a little higher overall, yeah. but if you want to be effective and you want to duplicate yourself, you have to get in the mindset of, I'm going to be a teacher I'm going to be, or coach. My husband is, um, he, he's gotten me hooked a little bit on Ted Lasso. I'm not going to tell him that. Cause I'm still like, we're in the fourth or fifth episode and he is obsessed yeah, yeah. with the show. He's going back and having me watch it. But yeah. it's, um, <laughs> you could be a coach and you, as a coach, you have to really look at life. So if you don't want to think about who is the best teacher, I'm not athletic. So I never really got into sports. So coaching is yeah. not the right, um, right analogy for me. But if yeah. you think about, and you watch, you watch cute shows like Ted Lasso and mm -hmm. you think, how can I, if, if I'm really wanting to make an impact and Ted Lasso talks about, he doesn't care if you win or if you lose, it's just that you get better. If yeah. that's what I brought to my employee, and I, it, all with the um, alignment of we, mm -hmm. we still have to hit these targets. Like we still have to hit these targets, but win or lose, I am with you. Are you with me? Are we on the same team? Are we rowing in the same direction? And there's some collaboration. I feel like that can really come with that, that it creates psychological safety in your organization. And when it comes to psychological safety, do you sometimes have to take a step back and really analyze what type of person you're dealing with at the time? Because everybody, you know, personality is different. So the way you word things and the way you give feedback to one person, you could have a positive effect and you could do it the same way with the next person. And it, it wasn't such a positive effect. So, you know, what do you do when you're dealing with so many different employees like you have? You know, how do you, ha you know, have the best positive effect when you're dealing with, you know, employees with similar problems? 
for sure. Step one is to know thyself because once I, so we have, we all have everybody in our team take a disc profile and then in our team's like name, it's, so it says Hillary Walsh driver slash influencer, because I'm on mm -hmm. the top quadrant of the, um, and I'm high driver and then a little bit influencer. Mm -hmm. Um, so when people interact with me, they should know they need to get to the point quickly. I don't want a whole lot of details. I want the point up front. Yes. And then when I'm interacting, so I have to know that very few people in my company are wired how I am. So yeah. they are not going to want to get the same. They don't want to digest the information or be fed the information in the same way that I do, yes. which mm -hmm. is hard because that's, that was the, the failing point for me and a lot of delegation is I wanted, I would tell people the ultimate vision and I wouldn't give them enough context or why, because I don't want to know those things in my life. I tell me where I'm going and I will figure it out. I will machete my way through and I will figure it out. Yes. But most people are not wired that way. Um, in my team, at least lots of people, maybe, but in my team, there were only three other drivers on my whole team yeah. blew my mind. And some of the people I work best with are other drivers because I never have to worry about hurting their feelings or, uh, it, you know, anything else where if wow. I'm working with a stabilizer or an analyzer, people who are on the bottom half of that quadrant, they like process, they like to know why they want to ask questions. They want to think through things. And it was like an aha moment in terms of delegating more properly for that yeah. person. And then I read a book by Cy Wakeman. And I can't remember what the title of the book is. She has a couple, but in it, she says that researchers found that most people only comprehend 7% of what you tell them in written communication. Wow. 7%. Most of my team members, English is their second language. So I'm guessing it's way lower. And that helped me understand that I, now I do a lot of loom videos where, you know, you share your screen and you're walking through something. And then if they want to read the transcript, they can read the transcript. If I can't have in a real time meeting where we're talking through things, because yeah. I want to write two or three sentences and move on to my next thought. Right. And so much of the problems I realized like the Taylor Swift song, like I'm yeah. the problem, it's me. And yeah. that helped me um, work better with people, um, a lot. And then when you think about the same with them, um, with feedback is helping yeah. understand, like, essentially it's a lot of just miscommunication. Where did I misfire on handing this off to you? Because yeah. I trust that you're trying hard. I trust that you want to win. I trust yeah. that you're, you're doing your best. It's probably in the way that I delivered the information to begin with, help yeah. me be better. And then really being open to that input. Right. And that's so important. You know, a lot of times I, I think we don't take always responsibility for our, our flaws and our mistakes. You know, we, we tend to not realize sometimes it could be us, the way we deliver the information, the way we expressed it to the other individual. So sometimes when there are mistakes that are made, sometimes we have to go back and reanalyze, how did I get this message across to that other individual? You know, and maybe you know, take some responsibility. Well, maybe I, I didn't do a good enough job. Maybe if I, you know, did this and this, you know, and then, you know, or just like reinforcing it at the end, you know, sometimes we give orders and, you know, okay, I need this done, this done, this done. And then we don't take the time to like, maybe just do a, a brief, you know, brush over what we, we've just discussed and to make sure the other person, you know, ask, understands and even take the time to ask them, did you understand everything I just explained to you? And, you know, them feel uncomfortable enough to give their feedback and say either yes or no, or, you know, this was a little confusing how you explained it. I really didn't get that. And some people, a lot of people probably would be afraid to say, oh, I, you know, or embarrassed that they didn't get something that you may have explained, you know, and, and so we have to make everybody feel comfortable within our group, I think, too. So they can, you know, you could give some, you know, give your, your instructions and the other person could say, yes, I did understand that, or I did up until this point, And then I got a little confused. Yeah. And a tool that I've used is just ask people, can you echo back to me what you heard me say? Because I will, I kind of talk around and I think out loud about what I'm wanting to do. And yeah. I'm like, I don't even really remember exactly at the end of the day, what I said, because I was talking through so many different scenarios. Can you echo back to me what you heard? So I yeah. make sure that we're on the same page and I am consistently amazed 
that it doesn't matter if they are the best and the brightest. Sometimes there's a misfire right there in that initial conversation. No wonder three months from now when this project is supposed to be done, it's not quite what I was looking for because I didn't communicate it very well. Right, right. So the echoing back is really helpful. I think that's an excellent point to make. I think the echo and back is very important because I think when when you ask them to repeat, you know, what you've just explained, that's when you can actually, you know, you know, you know, catch it in time. So, you know, you know, two months into the project, you know, it's not coming out exactly the way as planned, you know, and then, you know, a lot of time is lost you know, you'd want to catch it right in the beginning. But I think the echo and can you echo that back to me is, is a great, you know, uh, piece of uh, uh, information for people to know. It also helps when you're giving feedback, especially if it's critical feedback or coaching feedback for them to actually echo back to you what they're hearing you say, because yeah. they may just be wound around the axle I hate, like when my husband says, can I give you some feedback? I immediately go into, no, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> I don't yeah, want I get, the I feedback. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, uh, please don't ask because the answer is always no. Um, yeah. But it's really good because uh, when, when someone says, yeah, yeah, let's have that conversation. Or maybe you brought them in and you got to have the, this is your final form of feedback. Yeah. You need to hear what are they processing? Because if they're taking away the wrong message and now they're just mad at themselves, or maybe they're mad at you, they feel misunderstood. Yeah. then you're not being effective. Even if you said everything you needed to say, right, you're not being effective. And so you've got to make sure that what they're taking away is what you actually are delivering. Yeah. And as you kind of, as you pointed out at the very beginning of our conversation, it is sometimes so much more about how you say it than what you say yeah. to make sure that they, it's what you're wanting them to feel and hear and, and take away is landing yeah. with them. Because if you're harsh or serious, it doesn't matter if you're giving appreciation feedback, they're going to think something's wrong. Cause you said the F yeah. word, you said the feedback word. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think too tone, your tone of voice. And I, I think a lot of times people don't even realize their tone of voice. And even with my husband, he'll say things, but his tone, if he just said it in a different manner, I think I would have, I would have absorbed it much better. You know, I, I completely agree. I asked my husband to start sending me text messages with emojis because <laughs> I could not read, I could not read the room on his text messages. And then I would think like, why is he saying that? And next yeah. thing you know, I don't know if you've ever seen the key and peel skit where they're sending each other a text message and one person's like, Oh, that's so sweet. But really the person who's sending it's pissed off. So um, we we get a little bit into that, but the emojis help a lot with um, with quick communication. We're a very emoji heavy firm, even because yeah. it helps explain context to what the message is being sent. Like, hey, like can that. you send that to me right now? Can come across very differently than, hey, can you send me that right now with a smiley face? You know, right. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. I like that idea. I think a lot of times too, things can be miscommunicated, but like, let's, if you use the emojis, then I think the, uh, the, the, what the message you're actually trying to get across is much more clear. And a lot of pressure is kind of taken off like, oh, you know, they need it, but it, you know, they're, they're not mad at me. They're, you know, cool. they're, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Exactly. I like that a lot. I like that a lot. Are there any other tips that come off the top of your head that you think are really constructive about feedback that we didn't go over today that you think would help a lot of entrepreneurs, business owners, and even couples and relationships too? I think the best thing to do is a lot of inner work. When we have a negative relationship with anything, we have, including feedback, including critical feedback, if we find ourselves getting defensive every time we receive feedback, um, if we find ourselves like uh, something for me is realizing how rarely I will just say, I'm sorry. And mm -hmm. when you think about the kind of essentially the chart, the, the chain of events that have to happen in order to get to effective feedback, first, mm -hmm. you have to start with um, self-awareness. Mm -hmm. And then you can start identifying the problem and then you can reach empathy for where the other person might be at. So if you and I are having a conflict or we're not working well on something, if I come in and I lack self-awareness about how I'm communicating, what I might be responsible for in every single miscommunication, 
it's going to be really hard for me when it comes over to empathy, to have empathy for your situation, because I have not identified any of my responsibility in the problem. And I always bear some responsibility in any problem. And re when I realized that it, it made saying sorry, and um, I can see where you're coming from. And I hate when I feel that way, all the empathy uh, words made it a lot easier um, to have with my husband because I just, I felt right. I always felt right. And yeah. that makes you ineffective and unempathetic. And so yeah. of course my spouse is going to be defensive. Of course your, your um, coworker is mm -hmm. not going to want to hear what you have to say because you will not try to relate to where they might be coming from because you're not responsible at all for this situation. So yeah. I think really starting, it's such an inside job. It so starts with that inner work that we have to do as leaders. Yeah. Oh, that's such a great point. I think, you know, because I think a lot of times people have the, the, the they, they, you know, it's just their personality. They've done it for so long. It's become a bad habit thinking I'm always right. I'm always right. And they only see things through their pair of eyes instead of just taking a, you know, a, a moment just to take a deep breath and maybe look at it through, you know, a larger glass, you know, and really thinking about, I'm not always right, you know, and, and keeping that mentality in their head, you know, I may not be always right. And I like, you know, not having to jump. We've had many conversations where, you, you know, not to jump and say, I'm sorry all the time, because that's not good either. Because sometimes people, you know, they're not really sorry. They didn't really do anything wrong, but immediately I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know, I hope I didn't offend you. Oh, I'm sorry. And, you know, it, then it does it, that empathy, like you said, isn't it's ineffective, you know, it's just not, you know, we have to really look at the whole situation and do that inner work. And then we can really come to, you know, other person realizing that, well, maybe I made a mistake and then they understand the situation better. And then that communication is made, that bond is made between the two people and they both could have empathy for each other and the situation itself. Absolutely. Definitely. Absolutely. We've done some good work here today. Yes. <laughs> if you had to take our whole conversation today and you really want to emphasize on some important factors of what we discussed today, what are some of the things you really like the listeners to leave with? Start with you. Ever, you are somehow responsible for every problem in your life. Some way, somehow you're either tolerating something, um, you're avoiding something, whatever it is, and identify that because otherwise you're going to find that problem cropping up in all these other areas of your life. And that will then help you move forward and be able to be more effective. And I think just give more appreciation feedback. It doesn't mean that if an employee who you're looking around and you're like, I need to let this employee go, this yeah. isn't the time to start showering them with appreciation feedback. It's time to make the difficult decision that if they're really not right for your company or a friend or even a relative, yeah. Um, they're not right for where, for your values and, and where you want to go in your life. You need to make the difficult decision and just do it. But if that's someone who, you know, you want to keep in your life and you know, you want to um, create a deeper relationship with give equal measure to critical feedback um, mm -hmm. as you do with appreciation feedback. And you're going to walk around and realize you're saying, thank you. I see what you're doing and don't say it about the person. Don't make it individually about them because sometimes it's easy to have favorites Instead, yeah. make it about the work that they're doing and how they're aligned with your company's values or even your own values and your targets that you have in your life. Right. Oh, I like that. That's a great piece of advice. Now, tell us a little about the services that you provide in your company. For the most part, I help a lot of immigration law firms with their businesses, but we also do sales coaching. Um, we help train reception teams so they can have great customer service. And we have a podcast as well. It's called Let's Get Rich, where we kind of share how we, because I believe getting rich is not actually revenue. It's growing emotionally and spiritually and making an impact and having a legacy in these things. And so it's a little bit of a play on the idea of wealth being yes. monetary. It's more like I would much rather be wealthy spiritually and emotionally. Um, yes. I think that uh, financial wealth will be a, a secondary benefit. But mm -hmm. let's get rich is kind of where we talk through some of these things. And it's me and my husband. And uh, we talk through things like you've had on your podcast where it's great to be sober because now we have clear minds and it's great to take care of ourselves um, internally and, and physically because we, we got to do that. So those are those are the types of things that I help folks with. 
Oh, I love it. I love it. Now, where can people find you if they want to find you and they want to, you know, learn more about you and the services you provide? Where can they go? Instagram is the easiest place to find us. Um, I'm at attorney Hillary. And then newfrontier.us is my website if you need any immigration legal services. Oh, I love it. Well, this has been wonderful. I really enjoyed this time with you. I think today's um, podcast was so beneficial because I, you really provided a lot of great information. And a lot of this information is very resourceful because, you know, a lot of times we tend to, it's not that we we lack it, we sometimes for, forget, you know, like we get caught in our own little bad habits or ways of doing things and we forget, you know, what what's really the way things should really be done or the way things should be said. And, and you know, because sometimes it, we just overlook things, but we have to pay attention to, you know, who we're talking to, how we're saying it, you know, and really have that communication because communication is key. That's what makes, you know, that's what makes everything work in a, in a, in a very smooth and, and, and timely fashion and a productive way. You know, if, if you can have communication with the people around you, you know, you'll have a very tight bonded, you know, um, either company or family life or whatever the case may be. But I always say communication is key. And you prove that today with all the advice you gave it. That's what it basically came down to is really having good communication and appreciation for each other. And, and that gratitude, which is, is very important. Everybody should really have gratitude because sometimes we, we think about what we don't have and we should think about what we do have and it makes a big difference in how you view life and everything around you. So thank you so much. You, you've been a, a great um, person to talk to today. And I'm so glad you came on our show as a guest. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Have a great one. Oh, you too. You too. Bye-bye.